for the next presentation and the presentations to follow. Um, we do have two microphones left at the front if you would also like to step up to ask questions at the microphone. Um, so I don't know if I'm shaking because I've had so much coffee or because I'm going to talk to you about Dr. Jane Belknap. Um, so I would like to introduce to you Dr. Jane Belknap. Uh, she has been a research ecologist with the Department of the Interior since 1987. And she's currently leader at the U.S. Geological Survey Station in Moab, Utah. She earned bachelor degrees um, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, master at Stanford University, and a doctorate at Brigham Young University. Dr. Belknap is one of few experts on biological soil crust. Her research has demonstrated the importance of dry lands in sustainability and conservation. Specifically, her research highlights the role of biological soil crust in soil stability, invasive vegetation, nutrient cycling, and hydrology, as well as soil crust response to climate change. Her work exemplifies sustainability as she aims to address questions uh, relating to how drylands can be managed and sustained, but still support activities such as grazing, recreation, and development. As a result, Dr. Belknap has traveled ex extensively to pursue this aim, from Iceland to Australia to Kenya. Moreover, her work has societal impacts, and she often trains land managers and practitioners on best management practices for drylands. Dr. Belknap has authored textbooks on biological soil crust, over 260 peer-reviewed articles, and has worked with over 300 collaborators. She has been president of the Soil Ecology Society, Ecological Society of America, ESA, Soil Ecology Section, member of ESA Governing Board and Publication Committee, and serves in various editorial roles for ecological applications and eco-hydrology. In 2008, ESA named her one of the most outstanding ecologists in the U.S. In 2010 and 2013, she received Outstanding Women in Science Awards from the U.S. Department of the Interior. In 2015, she was elected Fellow of ESA, a prestigious award. And so, without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Jane Thelma. much you guys you've done an amazing job of pulling this together it's really a delight and everybody's so enthusiastic it's just extra cool um, I actually yesterday well I put a talk together and then yesterday finally read what I was supposed to talk about and I was like oh no <laughs> so I put this talk together quite quickly uh, but this will be really fun, and I'm going to spend the time just introducing you to BioQuest because most people don't have a clue what they are or what they do. So I'm not going to be talking about the management of how you actually can keep them sustainable, as much as to hopefully convince you that this is a resource that we cannot afford to lose, and that most managers don't even know they exist, and so that's what I do traveling around the world is just you know, showing people what they are and how much they matter to the systems that they're trying to keep intact. So soils are often neglected, uh, but they really are the fundamental basis of everything. Uh, they are what the plants grow in, we eat plants to live, the animals that we eat, eat plants to live. Everything is being mediated to those soils. You know, we've got the sunlight coming down and the rocks weathering out and they're all coming together at soils but it's incredible that despite that that we really don't pay much attention to them and when you hear people talking about sustainability they hardly ever talk about soil sustainability what they talk about is cities water other things like that um, but without our soils we're toast basically so the first talk that i put together i actually was about global soil loss and I still kept a few slides of that because I wanted to illustrate how much human activities is accelerating soil erosion. Um, you, here's a baseline of natural weathering. We're on order of magnitude higher than that through time um, in different places. 
the lines didn't show up, but um, there is a line here. There, oh, there it is um, for crop, cropping in the U.S. and cropping in other places in the world. We've really become an agent of change for soils. But these are croplands, and the thing that struck me as I was looking for anything on dry lands is I could find nothing. Um, and so, oh, and, our, and then there's that downstream effect of losing those soils. We have hypoxia zones and, and dead places in oceans, really a big deal. But again, we have no equivalent for dry lands. Dry lands are occupy 40% of our terrestrial land mass. I mean, it's, they're huge, and yet we don't know much about them in terms of soil loss or what sorts of impacts that human activities are having on them. And this is a horrible slide, but this is also lands that are being degraded. And basically, the clear things that you can't see are, are sand seas, but all that red are semi-arid landscapes, pretty much. There's a few exceptions on that, but most of it that is under some degree of degradation at this point. So a lot of thinking in ecology recently has been around the critical zone. And people are talking about how there's this critical zone on Earth that is kind of, it's the surface of the Earth and the surface of the atmosphere above the Earth. But when most people talk about it, they're talking about it being meters deep. They're looking at forests with the plant roots going down meters and meters above the surface. And what I hope to convince you by the end of this talk is that in dry lands, that can be the top millimeter, can be the top few millimeters, maybe the top centimeter or two. But really in dry lands, our critical zone seems to be happening right at the soil surface, which is of course incredibly vulnerable to loss when those soil surfaces are disturbed. So in dry lands, most surfaces are covered by biological soil crust, or biocrust as I will refer to them. Those are cyanobacteria and fungi, which are the microscopic guys that really hold the soil together. And then on top of that comes mosses and lichens. And depending on the different composition of these guys, you'll have very different ecological roles for these soil crusts. They occur just about anywhere light can reach the soil surface. So more traditional places you think of as dry lands, but also the Serengeti, um, up in Alaska, where you have ash flows. Anywhere the light can reach the soil surface, you're going to pretty much have some form of biocrust. And that can even be in temperate forests where the soil infertility has kept the plants from growing very close together. So they're pretty much everywhere. And I mean everywhere there's not plant material. And where there isn't, then you've got them covering most of the soil surface. So they're mediating most inputs and out goes from that soil. And in deserts, that's a huge space. And so that's why they're probably more important in dry lands than other places, but they certainly have roles to play in other places. And I'll be going through each of these in more detail. So the thing about dry lands really is that this huge inner space between the plants. It can be a meter, it can be two meters, it can be five meters. They can be huge. And those are generally covered by some form of crust. And so therefore, you've got this much greater landscape is the soil crust. It's not the best of your plants. And in fact, in biodiversity, if you want to see the biodiversity of a dry land system, get down on the soil surface because that's where it is. It's not the best of your plant community. Um, much more biodiversity is happening there. And that's without the microbes, that's just the macro guys. So first of all, I'm going to talk about hydrology. Soil crust, depending on who's present, can make the path length of water be much shorter or much longer. Where you have a really well-developed soil crust, you have this incredible meh that the water has to do to get off of that site. And basically, it doesn't. It pretty much soaks in. Um, if you have just the cyanobacterial crust, which is what we get when you disturb these soil surfaces or you're in a hyper-arid desert, then you have a very short path length, and so the water can run off much more quickly. The permeability and resistance to erosion is very much dependent on who is president, present and their biomass. Who's president? I love it. Um, Donald Trump! Um, so if you've got a bare soil, you're going to have water soaking in much more quickly than if you have a moss or a lichen or something on the surface because they're going to absorb the water too. And so it's really dependent on who's present about the effect that 
the crusts have on hydrology. And if you look at using rainfall simulators and other things, the cyanobacteria crust here is also, like I said, it, it can be a really newly disturbed surface, it can be a newly recovering surface, but you can see that runoff, you have much greater runoff than you do a well-developed crust because you don't have that bumpy surface to slow the retention time, and you have a great deal more sediment coming off of those plots because you don't have that biomass to glue everything together. And as a result, attached to that sediment and in that water is carbon and nitrogen. And so where you have much greater runoff in sediment production, we also have a much, whoa, much greater uh, carbon loss and a much greater nitrogen loss. So again, vulnerability because these do carbon and nutrients are concentrated in the top few millimeters. The soil crusts are very important for albedo of surfaces. Again, if you just take off that top millimeter, you can change the color of that surface from a dark, dark color to a very light color. We've done this experiment in the western U.S. over well, about 250 million acres. Um, so we really, really impacted the albedo of our surfaces. This can have very large implications for regional climate because instead of heat being absorbed, the hot air now rises off the surface. It's dry and if there's clouds in the air, it can push them away. Certainly feeds into global carbon models as well. People, you know, we really, it, this is hard to do because we don't know what the West used to look like. But the examples we have of ungrazed and uncropped systems, we have Generally, in these dry lands, we have a nice soil crust that is dark versus this light surface that we have in many places today. One of the most exciting things that's being worked on right now is how soil crusts determine plant community composition. So it turns out that if you have a cyanobacterial crust or bare soil, that pretty much any seed can get in and germinate. Whether or not it then lives depends on the climate and things, obviously. But if you have a large seed or you have um, big appendages like this, whoops, like this right here, you can't even get in a well-developed lichen or moss crust. You're not going to germinate, you're not going to grow. And so what we're seeing in some very large data sets is that the type of crust is actually determining what plants can grow there. So it's a really cool thought if you think about this successional Succession through time, you're going from bare soil to cyanobacteria to lichens and mosses. What you're doing is screening out plants with large seeds and appendages. Something comes along, disturbs the surface, resets that, and now you can get those plants establishing again. And then through time, as the crusts go through the successional sequence, they're going to be keeping out those plants from reestablishing themselves. So there's this real interesting idea that over very large landscapes, that the type of soil crust present determined by the amount of disturbance present is going to determine what plants are growing. Biocrusts are very important in nutrient cycling. They add a lot of carbon and especially a lot of nitrogen to the soil. A recent paper by Albert et al. suggested that up to 50% of the biological nitrogen fixed on the planet was done by cryptogams. Woohoo for the little guys. Um, Biocrusts are a major part of that cryptogamic cover. And certainly in dry lands, where we have actually very few nitrogen-fixing plants to contribute, we have very little lightning and rainfall to contribute fixed nitrogen, the soil surfaces play an incredibly important part in getting nitrogen to these systems. Um, and this is one of our major fixers here, Kalima 10X, our best friend. So press also captured dust. Dust has a lot of nutrients in it. It can really make soils fertile. Down here, um, we did a cute little study where we looked at the top zero to two centimeters, the nutrients versus the four to six centimeter nutrient levels, and we, could, we saw an enrichment of phosphorus and, well, everybody, basically. And phosphorus, of course, to me, and Peter, <laughs> is our favorite thing for limiting systems. Everyone focuses on nitrogen. Frankly, I think it's because nitrogen's easy to study. Phosphorus is hard. Um, but I'm convinced that for us, phosphorus is the big deal. Um, and we really do see a great enhancement of phosphorus. In addition, the, nutrient, the fungi in the soil press secrete phosphatase, which nobody has shown, but has the potential to increase the availability of phosphorus in these alkaline soils. Um, and so that is a really important role for these crusts is that 
both the retention of the dust and then the nitrogen and carbon fixation. Something else that most people don't really think about in deserts is that most precipitation events are very, very small. In Moab, where we have 230 millimeters of rain-ish, about 71% of our rain events are less than 5 millimeters. As you get into more arid settings, that increases. So basically, if you think about 5 millimeters of rain raining down, it's not going to go into the soil very far. That implies that most nutrient transformations in these systems are happening at the surface, not down to the level where the plant roots hang out. At least some systems, some deserts have plant roots at the surface. Many don't because if they don't have reliable summer rainfall, they just die and they're too dry. But this, what can happen as a result is you have a spatial and you have a temporal disconnect between the nutrient availability and plant uptake. Nutrients are at the surface, they're being transformed and made available and with those tiny rain events, and then every once in a while you get a big rain event that washes it down to the plant roots. The implication for that is that you again have all this available nutrients sitting at the surface where it's very vulnerable to loss if that surface is disturbed. So, um, very problematic for these ecosystems that already have very infirm, infirm soils. This is a super cool thing that we're just starting to explore. Um, because one of the things is, okay, if all the nutrients are at the surface and there's no plant roots up there, what good does it do to the plant? Do they actually even get to see the nutrients created or captured or what, you know, held onto by the soil crust? And uh, three studies now, one I did in my backyard, one was done in China, one was done at Sevieta in northern New Mexico, show that if you label the inner space with labeled nitrogen and carbon, it shows up in a plant a meter away in 24 hours. That's incredible. And we only added it with a millimeter and a half water. So, you know, this is through the, just the biocrust, just the surface. It implies it has to be a fungal network because bacteria and cyanobacteria aren't connected like that. Um, and so the other thing is if we labeled the plant with the same, we saw the carbon come back to the biocrust. Well, the biocrust don't need nitrogen because they fix it, but the fungi do. The fungi thrive on carbon, that's their energy source. And so our idea is that maybe there is this fungal loop happening where the crusts are fixing the nitrogen, things are getting sucked over to the plant, the plant is returning carbon to subsidize the fungi to bring them back the nitrogen. Um, so, and this is all in root-free soil. So this is an incredibly awesome idea that the roots and all those underlying soils that we've always thought were so incredibly important in nutrient cycling, in dry lands, maybe, maybe not. The other implication that's really exciting is that these surfaces are dominated by dark septate fungi. We don't know much about them, but they have the ability to actually go through plant stems, they can go up a plant and in through the stomates. They're not just root bound like mycorrhizae. And so we may also have a totally new way of getting nutrient uptake in these dry land systems. Whatever, plants do grow bigger and more nutritious in biocrust than not. So you know, whatever the mechanism is, however they're getting these nutrients, they're certainly getting these nutrients. And so we've done this in the field, we've done this in pots, it just is the way it is over and over again. And bigger, more biomass as well. In terms of carbon though, the story is kind of interesting. So we've had chambers out for years um, that automatically go up and down and up and down 24-7. And what we see is that the soil crust, is this, and our colors go down about 30 centimeters, and we don't really know and nobody knows how much area actually that CO2 is coming out of, you know, maybe it's the top five centimeters, maybe it's the top 30, you know, we really don't know. But overall, this system is a source of CO2, very small. I mean, this over here is a tiny, tiny number. But still, they're not acting as a sink. They're not this tropical forest out there, as some papers have suggested, that in our system at least. And we had a colleague in China find this exact same thing at about the same latitude. Very small sink. But then one has to ask, you know, if they're such a small sink, do they actually really contribute carbon to the system? Um, but then we found, and then 
to go on down this thought is a recent paper suggests that semi-arid vegetation may be a major controller on the global carbon sinks during wet years. So they found up to 60% of, in some very wet years in Australia, the vegetation in Australia was 60% of that variability of the carbon sink. Well, at least in the lab, and we are testing right now in the field, those same dark septate fungi can actually double the biomass of vascular plants that grow in semi-arid systems. So that crusts again can be playing this very large but indirect role in making the plants get bigger. And so that we actually do, even though they seem to be a small source, they may actually be increasing the sink of these systems. You disturb them though, and everything goes the opposite direction. The nitrogenase activity, we have not measured end fixation with 15N, so we can only say the potential end fix goes to zero almost immediately. Um, that it doesn't matter what desert you're in, the nitrogen fixation stops because the organisms get smashed. So any sort of surface disturbance, um, and we lose these inputs. You don't have to smash them. Um, we did this experiment by just watering them very small rain events more frequently. And what we did was kill off the moss almost immediately within about six weeks. And what we suddenly saw was our system went from an ammonium-dominated system to a nitrate-dominated system, making it a really different kind of nitrogen cycle. And nitrate, unfortunately, is much more easily lost. Um, it's both through gaseous means and leaching. So we may also be setting up this, this system in this particular place to losing more nitrogen out of those already infertile soils. So, what about soil stability? Um, we're all familiar with the Dust Bowl. It was a big deal. Everybody went, you know, ah, as they should have. And unfortunately, oh, and it was very hot and dry there. You can see that year, was, those years were pretty bad. Um, but everybody tends to think it's over. And I'm here to tell you it's not over, that we have massive dust storms. Guys, in Texas know that, especially El Paso um, and Lubbock. <laughs> They're very familiar with very large dust storms. That's a Lubbock down there, that's Lubbock. Uh, this is Phoenix, and this is a dust storm coming off the Sahara Desert headed towards the Caribbean to help kill off the corals. Um, they're very global, so they're not just local, they're not just regional, they have extensive global impacts when they're moving around the world. We're getting far more storms now than we used to, and they tend to be very, very large. Not, but I have to add that the satellites only pick up very large dust storms. So we can have a lot of dust storms and we won't ever even see them. And even ones this big aren't necessarily detectable by satellite for very long. You might see just a blip, but um, you, they have to be enormous to pick up by satellite. So when we see them increasing on satellite imagery, you're pretty safe to say that you're having a lot of local increase that you're not seeing, um, as well as the more regional and international ones. And biocrust disturbance, or the disturbance of that soil surface, is really key in these dust storms. So I ran around with a wind tunnel all over the western US, and we did thousands of runs, and I just threw a few in here, to show that it doesn't matter pretty much what soil type you're on. If you disturb the soil surface, which is the gold bars, we just ran over it once with our suburban, um, and then put the tunnel back down on, you get a huge increase in sediment production. With the exception of fine sands, fine sands just blow even if you just look at them, you know, they're just a very unstable surface. So there are places, the edges of playas are very active, new washes are very active, there's nothing to stabilize them yet. So where things are already, and fine sands don't really have good biocrust on them, so these substrates that are just kind of mobile are going to blow anyway, but they're not the vast majority of deserts, or most deserts, especially the western U.S. And the other thing to notice is how little blows when you don't disturb it. So we're used to all thinking that deserts are dusty places, but my biggest light bulb off of this activity was realizing they're not. That it's mostly human-caused disturbance that is creating the 
image that we have of deserts as dusty places. And why? Here's what soil crusts look like with the scanning electron micrograph. These are those cyanobacteria and fungal filaments. They're just literally linking sand grains together, and they're making big aggregates, and then even those aggregates are strung together. So it's really hard to blow these guys, or wash these guys, and that's why um, previously the slides of the hydral, the hydrologic graphs, you saw that the sediment was so reduced, and the reason is it's really hard to move these guys if they have a lot of biomass. They're incredibly stable. So we, um, Jason Neff, I should, oh, I forgot to add. I didn't have any names on the beginning of my slide because this presentation is from a cast of thousands. Um, there's been just so many people involved in this work that I don't, didn't even want to start to try to use three slides to put all their names. So that's why there wasn't any. But lots of people, credit goes to all of them. Um, this was a study done on lake cores up in the high southern Rockies to look at dust inputs over time. Because one of the big questions is, well, okay, you say that dust has increased, has it really increased? Um, and these two lakes would say, yes, indeed, it really has increased. So this is just the dust input. It's, you can measure it by using um, magnetic susceptibility. You can tell whether it's a, from the parent material that's right there if you have a non-magnetic parent material. Um, you can just look at what kind of magnetic particles you have and quantify the dust. So what we can see here is that we didn't have much dust way back then, but when the livestock herds hit the west, all of a sudden we saw this huge increase in dust production. So this is the southern Rockies, so this is probably only coming from Arizona, Utah, and Nevada. It's not going to be because the Sierra are going to block the rest. And so this is just that zone. This is not Kansas and Nebraska and all that. This is really just that inner mountain area. Um, and we really did increase dramatically the amount of dust going into this lake course. And then it kind of relaxed back. This is the Taylor Grazing Act when the lands, even the ranchers came and said, please help us manage this place. It's a disaster where there's nothing for the livestock to eat. Um, and so we do see, we did see a relaxation back a bit, but now it's actually starting to increase again. Um, and it's not a surprise. We're having tremendous oil and gas development, solar sites. Solar sites seem nice, except that they blade all the vegetation. And then they leave them sitting there for a couple of years before they do anything with them. And they blade much bigger areas than the solar sites, so you know they contribute to dust too. Uh, but all these roads, all these unpaved roads out there, there's just thousands of miles. Even there's 6,000 miles in southeast Utah alone of unpaved roads, and we're not an exceptional area of the West. It's incredible the amount of unpaved roads, and unpaved roads give off dust whether they're being driven on or not. Um, Oil and gas comes in, they create huge numbers of roads. We have a lot of invasion by annual grass now. The annual grass is a bad deal in terms of dust because it drought years it doesn't germinate so that you have no protection of the soil surface. And annual grasses and biocrust don't get along, so they pretty much nuke the biocrust. And then they provide fuel after wet years, and then they burn, and then you've got more dust. So Annual grasses are a big deal, which is a really important reason to keep the crust intact because they keep the annual grasses out because they have really big seeds. And we've noticed this for years, that where you have a really nice developed soil crust, you do not have the invasion of the Mediterranean annual grasses. They're very good at it. But if you bust them up, they're higher in nitrogen, so the annual grasses have a heyday. It's a very double-edged sword. The other things that are going on in the West is that we still have a lot of livestock grazing. Um, certainly not what we used to have. 1940 here, you can see we had like three and a half million animals, and that actually was far less than the late 1800s, where there was like 10 million-ish. They didn't count them, so they don't know. They just said, oh, that's way less than we used to have. Um, They've produced, but there's still a million and a half animals out there, and each one has four hooves, and four hooves 
you're out there stomping around. So that's a big deal. Also, we have a lot of wildlife. Um, this is just the deer numbers. We, as the state of Utah, want to make sure that everybody who gets a hunting tag will find somebody to shoot. And so even though we only had about 15,000 deer in the state of Utah in 1900, the goal for the division is 450,000, and they're at about 430 right now. So that, again, is for hooks. And this does not, um, I didn't have a slide, I forgot to put a slide in for recreation. Just reminds me, because we have a lot of antler hunters that then take their ATVs and just grid the place, looking for antlers, driving over every square inch. Um, we have tons of off-road vehicles and other people out there to enjoy the landscape and to drive on challenging routes. We also have climate change coming, right? And with climate change, we are expecting in the southwest hotter and drier conditions. So we've had vegetation plots out um, in the Canyonlands National Park since 1987. And basically, we see a pretty steep decline in grasses with an increase in temperature. So we're expecting that at some point we're going to lose our grasses. When we put those, the reduction of cover in a wind model, we see that we get a very large increase in dust. And that's at a high spring wind speed, and these are down to very low speeds. But these are, none of these are unrealistic speeds. We have some communities that aren't changing much, and neither will the dust production. Some communities that are changing, not overall, but on certain soil types, they are very much declining, and their dust will very much increase. And then other communities, again, this is a C4 shrub community. Oh, and I should add that, because this was totally counterintuitive. These are C3 grasses. Okay, we all expect them to decline. This is a C3 shrub doing just fine, and the C4 shrub is dying off. Um, so it's kind of like, oh, we're not going to be able to just use functional type to tell us about what plant communities are more susceptible to drought and which are not. We're going to have to instead really look species by species because um, it's not even holding to a genus. Um, we're seeing a huge variability among different species of who's more vulnerable to drought. We have rainfall shelters up that we've had up for 10 years now. We get the same result as this. Um, the C3 grasses are tanking, the C4 shrub that we have it over is tanking, and this C3 shrub black brush is doing just fine. But the, end, the message of this slide is that if you have a reduction in plant cover, you're going to have an increase in dust. So what about crust? We ran this model just for fun. We eliminated, went all the way down to saying, okay, what if we don't have any plant cover? and we leave the crust intact. So this is not disturbed crust. We don't have any plant cover and we get almost no dust off that surface. We don't need the plants if we take care of our bio crust. And that was pretty cool. Um, and this is in, on clay, the, this is on sandy soils, this is on clay soils. So it's, you get nothing off the clay soils. You get a little bit off the sandy soils, but not much. When you start to disturb them, then you're gonna get erosion with and without the plants because you no longer have the crust protecting the surface. But that was fun. So why do we care about dust? Um, we care about dust for a bunch of reasons. Obviously you don't want to be in a car accident in dust because you can easily die. Um, the area between Phoenix and Tucson is getting hit repeatedly by very large pileups. Um, I actually drove into this, which was one of the stupidest things I've ever done in my life, because I could see the end of it. It was only like five miles wide, and of course I was in a hurry, and I'm like, oh, well, I'll just drive through it. You get in there, you can't see anything. And you can't slow down, because you're going to get rear-ended. You can't keep going, because you're going to rear-end someone. You can't pull over, because you can't see what pulling over means. It was just horrifying. I mean... You know, like you just start going like 10 miles an hour and praying a whole lot. Um, so, you know, I finally got it. It is apocalyptic. <laughs> it's nothing to, to do. You know, there's nowhere to be. So turn around. Um, we also care because of soil fertility. Again, we're talking wind erosion is that top couple of millimeters. That's where our fertility is. When we get 
soil erosion coming in at that kind of scale, it doesn't matter that it's not a meter of soil we're losing because we're losing huge amounts of our nutrients. So here's the kind of loss that we saw between a place that had been grazed and experienced soil erosion for sure, we've been measuring it for years, compared to an ungrazed grassland that is dominated by perennial grass and wonderful soil crust where we get zero soil erosion even in extreme drought years. So there's been a huge loss of nutrients and we don't get overland flow in these settings. So this is wind erosion and it's just an amazing difference between a crusted place and an uncrusted place. And the other problem with this is that with dust is that it blows to adjoining crusts and buries them. And so it's not just on-site impacts. It's not just directly driving over a crust and burying it, I mean destroying it, you can also bury adjoining ones. And the amount of soil loss isn't always at the millimeter scale, it can be huge. This is a storm in Southern California, this was about 20 hours of erosion. Um, this side of the fence was, whoopsie, this side of the fence was grazed, that side of the fence was not grazed, they had very little crust or plant cover to stabilize it and it was just stripped, they lost over a meter of soil during that time. Um, pretty extraordinary events. But this kind of stuff is currently still happening. And I just happened to look out my Beijing hotel window one morning and ta-da, it was a dust storm had blown in. And you can imagine the economic disaster here. Think of having an engine out there, you know, if you're a factory or you're a car or you're a whatever, you know, you're toast. And the economic impact is just huge of dust. The thing I spent the most time studying though is the effect of dust on snow. Um, my job has been to look at the production down in the lower elevations and then I've been collaborating with people who are up in the higher elevations looking at the dust coming in and what does it mean. Um, here's a storm coming in from the Moab area because of that nice red. You can tell where it comes from by the color. So this is the Moab area, that nice red snow coming, I mean dust coming into Aspen. Um, it covers huge landscapes when it comes in and makes them a different color. And that different color, as you will notice, notice is dark. When you have that darker surface, you basically get the deposition event and it's like stratigraphy. You've got an event and then snow, or an event and then snow. Well, when it melts, it actually melts underneath the dust so that during as you go through the season the layers collapse on top of each other so that it gets darker and darker and darker and melts faster and faster and faster. The end result being um, that dust can accelerate snow melt hugely. So we've over the time of this data set we went up to 2009, I mean 10, um, we show dust acceleration of 26 to 50 days depending on how much dust came in. I mean, that's almost two months, and we only have six months of snowpack. Snowpack is our major reservoir. It's not Lake Powell and Lake Mead and whatever big reservoirs you have here. It's the snowpack, and we're losing it. And that has huge implication for um, reservoir management, for late water supplies, I mean, late season water supplies, all that stuff. We're losing it. And if you're a skier, this sucks. Uh, and I want you to notice, though, that temperature only accelerated by 5 to 15 degrees. So it's not, rising temperature is not going to have anywhere near the impact of dust when it comes to having the snow disappear earlier. And we actually, 2011 was even dustier, and we lost, I think it was 55 days earlier melt in 2011. Um, we have, oops, let me just go to this one. So if you look at a hydrograph, you can see this earlier melt here. This was actually a rain event that happened, so you can kind of ignore that. But here's the normal slow extended melt. And in this year of 2009, it just went boom and just washed out of there. Well, that's a nightmare for somebody who runs a dam or reservoir because they don't know how much water to let out. They're trying to keep their dam full, but they don't want to let it too full or they're going to lose the dam. And so they've got these algorithms that they've been using for years and years and years that suddenly don't work um, because they're getting these huge slugs of water way too fast. 
And the worst is that you end up with less water overall. When you have that earlier melt, you have more evaporation of water from the soil. You have plants germinating earlier, so you have more about, um, transpiration from them. And so the modeling exercise we did showed that we have up to less, up to 7% less input to the Colorado River annually. This is huge. Um, we're already oversubscribed in the Colorado River. We're already having water wars over the Colorado River. And just dust alone, here's 7%. Um, and going to Lisa's talk, it makes me think, and I've always been thinking, well, what if we sell dust credits? Um, <laughs> because it's interesting sociologically, the problem is in the upper Colorado River Basin, where people are grazing their cows and oil and gas and recreating. But the people who are water shortaged is in this, this lower basin. So, you know, what if the people in the lower basin pay the people in the upper basin to keep their cows home? Um, we might actually see some very, very, water's expensive too. I mean, it's billions of dollars that our ag pays for their water. So, who knows? Maybe this will happen. So, in summary, I would just like to say um, that I really do believe that in deserts, we are a very different kind of critical zone. We're talking about a critical zone that isn't typical at all. It's not where we have really thick layers of soil organic matter. It's not where we have plant litter, you know, plants raining litter down all the time. What we have instead is a very, soils with very little horizon, very little development, but what we do have is right at that surface. It's not, you know, this nice, if you look in a soil textbook, that's not what our soils look like. Um, and what fertility we do have is concentrated right at that surface. We have tons of problems going on in these drylands because as human populations increase, those populations are pushing into areas where they never have been before because it's not a great place to make a living. The rainfall's too variable, the rainfall's too low, which means you plow up the landscape and your crop doesn't grow. Well, when that happens, you, we've lost the desert vegetation, we've lost the bio crust, we've lost the soil, you know, we're losing the soil fertility because then the topsoils are going to blow away, well, topsoil. Um, and it's really creating a whole new set of management issues than we've thought about before. So for instance, when we have wildfires, people still go in and do what they always did to get the forage plants back for the cow. Well, we need to start thinking instead of how do we keep the soils fertile and how do we keep the dust down as a management goal on top of what we typically do to get the forage back for the grazing. I'm not saying we don't need to get the forage back for the grazing. I'm just saying we need to bring in a new management goal of at the same time, let's worry about what's happening at the soil surface because traditionally we have not. In the West, we're sort of at this point like the Midwest reached when they suddenly discovered no-till. It's like, oh, we can, we can do something that doesn't make the soil blow away. You know, we really can approach a whole new way of plowing by thinking in a very different fashion. And that's really what the West needs to start thinking and what many drylands globally, the managers need to start thinking about how do they do what the activity they want to do, whether it be timing of activity or intensity of activity or location of activity in a way that keeps those soil surfaces intact. And again, I'm only talking about the top, top centimeter or so. So it's way harder than managing for the top few meters. I lost my dumb ending. Um, so we've had this warming experiment out for quite some time. It's 2005. And we've been heating soil crusts. And we've been seeing, you know, what's climate change in four, four degrees heating. Just look at what's going to happen um, with global change. And then we've also done this precipitation thing where we add more frequent, smaller events. And like I said, the mosses, we died off quite rapidly and stayed dead. It took some years for the mosses, so the green is the control, the red is the warm, and it took some years for the mosses to kind of tank with warming. 
And the same with the lichens. You know, they did just fine with the watering until about here, and then they went, eh. Um, and it wasn't until, like, you know, here they started to get away from the control in terms of warming, and now we've pretty much lost the lichens. Um, so we do need to worry about climate change. There is no doubt. And I'm not going to talk about cyanobacteria because they just move in when the mosses and lichens go. And we care the most about mosses and lichens because they fix the most carbon, they fix the most nitrogen, and they're the most stabilizing things. But the thing that really we need to keep in mind is that land use can do in five minutes what climate change is going to take 100 years or 200 years. And once we do this, it's really hard to fix. I mean, really hard to fix. It takes decades to fix, if ever. You know, if it's this, we're not going to fix it. Um, and there's plenty of that going on. So I just wanted to emphasize that we need to make sure that we don't get completely, like, distracted in a sense by climate change. It really matters. It's really important. But we also have tons of things going on deforestation, um, you know, all sorts of things where it's now, you know, it's not 2100, it's not 2200, it's right now that we really need to worry about and take action. Okay, now I can end.